Welcome back to Talk of the Town on 99.7, 1450WHTC and WHTC.com. And we welcome you back to Talk of the Town for this Wednesday, March 31st. I'm Gary Stevens. Due to circumstances beyond anyone's control, we could not have him on. It is usual fourth Friday of the month segment, but he was gracious enough to join us now to answer your law enforcement related questions. He is Ottawa County Sheriff Steve Kempker. He joins us from his offices in the Fillmore Street Complex uh, in West Allop. Steve, good morning and welcome back to Talk of the Town. Good morning, Gary. Good to be back. And uh, I apologize. I could not be with you last Friday and I'm uh, glad we could uh, find a time slot here this week. Uh, very good to uh, have you join us. And if you have a question for Steve, he'll be happy to answer it at 395-1450-395-1450. Let me start first with the uh, situation involving the George Floyd case in Minneapolis that is on trial now. Derek Chauvin, the former Minneapolis police officer charged in the death of Floyd last Memorial Day. And at one of the hearts of the situation involving that case, Steve, is the way that George Floyd was subdued that eventually led to his death. Uh, the measure and the tactics. We touched upon this when the incident occurred initially, Steve, but uh, the follow-up question was posed to me by Peg a little bit uh, because my father's background in the Detroit Police Department. I would think when you're trying to subdue a, a, a person that might be resisting, you're not alone. You don't do it alone. You have backup. You have supervisors. You have a lot of accountability. That would be the normal case where any law enforcement – talk us a little bit through what a professional law enforcement would be doing in a situation such as having a, a recalcitrant suspect that needs to be subdued and uh, taken to uh, uh, law enforcement situations. Uh, Gary, we uh, – in our agency, uh, I think I brought this up before, we just did a complete overhaul of our policy and procedures uh, in the sheriff's office. And uh, we had really good ones in place, but it was time to modernize some things. Uh, we brought in a, a firm uh, using our specific policy and procedures, but also bringing us up to the standards of federal law, state law, best practices, and the best practices for the Ottawa County Sheriff's Office. And uh, we do have a complete section called uh, Response to Resistance. And obviously every situation, and sometimes this is a little hard for the public to understand, um, Every situation is different, Gary. Uh, there, there's not a textbook paragraph for each situation. Uh, it depends on uh, the, uh, the suspect. Uh, it depends whether they're under the influence of a drug or alcohol. Uh, it depends too if, uh, if it's a fight or flight for them that they just do not want to go to, to jail or be arrested. So the officer has to make some very split second decisions. Uh, we train very heavily in uh, you know, verbal de-escalation, obviously, first. Uh, there are times that the deputy may be alone, especially for the sheriff's office, because uh, your backup could be anywhere from a couple minutes to 15, 20 minutes away. Uh, and I've always said through the years, that's where you've learned to talk and de-escalate people uh, and normally let them, you know, I always refer to it as let them get their steam out, uh, hear them out. Um, you know, and we've been very fortunate through the years that we do not get a lot of people that resist. Um, so again, we have very strict guidelines in place that have to be followed, uh, procedures that have to be followed, uh, protocol, obviously the reports that have to be done, the notification of the supervisor, and then also a, a review, a special uh, use of force form that's filled out for each incident, and that's reviewed. Now, when there's multiple officers on the scene, uh, yes, it sometimes is much easier to handle a subject that is uh, fighting or wrestling with you. We do not allow uh, the chokehold to be used. Uh, we are not training our people in that. Uh, they are trained, you know, to specifically try to control the arms and legs. Uh, we don't want to get into the respiratory areas. And there's also this thing out there that we're trained in is to watch for and observe for uh, to get medical attention or uh, even have them check by paramedics before they go to the jail uh, is, um, and I'm sorry, Gary, I just lost the, uh, the wording here, uh, uh, yeah. the excited, excited delirium. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, it's something we watch very closely for. Uh, when somebody comes into the jail, they are medically checked also after an arrest, whether there was resistance or no resistance. Um, so again, uh, you know, and I, I, I dropped you an email with a couple other things that we've now taken, I uh, put into place here at the sheriff's office. Uh, but again, the, the training, the de-escalation, you know, and you've heard me talk about this numerous times is, is evaluating a person where you're talking to them to see, you know, is this a mental health condition? Is it a medical condition? Uh, you know, through my 32 years on the agency, I've been on incidents on a medical situation where, you know, a person that's sometimes a diabetic or the sugar drops very low, uh, they can get combative with you. Uh, so again, uh, we, we take each situation has to be weighed very carefully. Um, we also have that duty to intervene. Uh, in our policy and procedure. You know, if another officer sees that another officer is going a little bit too far or it shouldn't be, uh, is that they will uh, intervene. Before I get to Peg's question, I do have a caller on the line. Good morning, you're on the line with Sheriff Steve Kempker. Yes, I was wondering about all the um, cars we see driving around with no license plate at all. And usually it's kind of a, um, if you would say somebody is a suspect looking person, mm -hmm. um, that's the kind that doesn't have a plate. And I was wondering why this is right now happening. Well, I think again, uh, for the caller and Gary, uh, we can thank COVID for this. Uh, you know, the secretary of state's offices, you know, they were shut down. People were given uh, uh, some leeway there to get their plates on the vehicles. Uh, matter of fact, the other day, and it, uh, it was, kind of clever. I saw, I had to look twice at it. I saw a car a guy wrote a note in the back window says I've applied for my license uh, plate uh, due to COVID. Uh, can't get it yet. Um, some of that has eased up now. I would have to double check and I can get back with you, Gary, but I think uh, now, uh, you know, we have been stopping cars where plates are not visible because I think that time limit is up. Uh, you know, there's other means to get your plates. The Secretary of State's office, I believe, are running people through now. Um, so again, we, we saw a lot of lapses in expired license plates, people purchasing, you know, if they purchased from the dealership, the dealership was issuing that temporary plate in the back window, but if they purchased from a private party, uh, they were not getting the license plate. And obviously we tell, and this is a good reminder for people, when you sell a car on your own to a private party, make sure you take your license plate off that car and keep it in your possession. Uh, we've had them turn up in criminal activity. We've had them turn up, uh, the other because uh, that plate is still registered to you. So keep your license plate. But um, I think, you know, we're seeing less and less cars without plates um, as the Secretary of State's office plays catch up. I appreciate the call. Thank you very much. 395-1450, 395-1450. Let's go to the newsroom. Peg McNichol had a follow-up call on our earlier uh, talk about uh, uh, restraints and situation involving the George Floyd uh, arrest. This is for the flip side. What I've noticed is that, that we've seen a number of incidents, as I know your deputies have, where people have gotten really exercised and upset in a situation and it escalates. So for people who, this is a personal leadership question. If you're in a situation where you're unhappy with what's going on, what do police officers do to maintain, I've seen officers in very high stress situations and they're very respectful. And what, what mechanism do you guys keep in mind so that you don't end up on your side getting exercised and upset? And what, it's just advice for people who might be in that situation themselves in a store or another situation like that. Yeah, well, Peg, and I think we've talked about this prior, um, you know, tensions are still high. Uh, COVID is still under everybody's skin a little bit. Um, you know, during some of the lockdown where we were really unable to do some things. Uh, you know, our domestics went uh, up, obviously. Um, so the, with those tensions, uh, people sometimes want to verbally lash out. Um, this is part of our de-escalation training is, you know, I have found in the past, sometimes it's best just to listen to somebody. Uh, sometimes they're making sense, but they are just so angered. They don't know which way to go. Um, and sometimes we deal uh, with people that have anger management issues. Um, so again, we're trained in that de-escalation. Uh, you know, when we had sent some help to Grand Rapids City, our guys were on the front line uh, in the riots there, uh, and they took a lot of verbal abuse. Uh, they had bottles thrown at them. They were spit upon, uh, stuff thrown in their faces. Um, you know, that's one of the things I, I kind of say, you know, we, you're, this is the job that we signed up for. 
And there are very tough times. I've been in those times where people have been just inches from my face, uh, yelling and screaming. Um, and again, uh, it, it doesn't do any good for us to get all wound up and start yelling and screaming and back and forth. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen it through the years where a couple of people, a uh, deputy and a uh, person they're dealing with are yelling at each other. And they finally both looked at each other and thought, neither one of us are getting anywhere. Why are we sitting here screaming at each other? Um, so to take that time to de-escalate, listen, uh, you know, just talking and try to be understanding because sometimes a lot of people do have some legitimate concerns. And, uh, you know, there are times that I agree with people and say, you know what, you are absolutely right. Uh, you know, let's talk about this uh, and take that time. Uh, I've gone and I've seen other deputies have gone from yelling and screaming matches at a house to the point where you're sitting down drinking coffee with them at their table before you leave. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that definitely is uh, cooling, you know, cooler heads do prevail in those situations. They do. And, and uh, again, as long as we can maintain our composure, uh, sometimes that helps bring down it. And it's called a training that we take. It's called verbal judo. And uh, it's how to talk with people, how to listen to people, how to try to reason with people. Now, again, obviously, as you know, in our society, there are times where people are not going to give in or reason. Uh, again, because of either are under the influence of something, uh, they may have another issue going on. And that's where, again, our training has to kick in to try to talk. There have been times where people have just yelled and screamed at a deputy. The deputy says, I'm, I'm sorry, but you know, until you calm down, um, I'm going back over here. And once you calm down, we'll talk with you. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, over the years, you get the jeers as you drive, you know, our guys, you know, they'll hear the, the name called at them. Um, uh, you know, I would say 100% of our deputies just kind of smile and, and keep on moving on. Uh, it's, it's, it, there's no sense in getting into a big confrontation. Patience, you have to pack your patience if you are wearing blue or brown. 395, you know, some of us are wearing brown, but it wasn't, wasn't because I was... Uh, <laughs> I would do what I was going to be talking with you, Steve. I, or, as I said last hour when I was wearing I was wearing the brown because of Zeeland East. But anyway, uh, 395, 14, 50. 395-1450 if you have a question for Ottawa County Sheriff Steve Kempker. Certification process from the Department of Justice and reporting use of all force to national FBI data collection. Are those sort of an offshoot of what happened up in Minneapolis last Memorial Day? Uh, it was. Actually, the uh, FBI reporting uh, was prior to that. Uh, we joined right on board. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm proud to say that all 83 sheriffs in the state of Michigan uh, are on board uh, of reporting. And uh, I think Michigan has one of the highest uh, numbers of law enforcement agencies that report nationwide to the FBI uh, our statistical information on uh, use of force incidents. Uh, so that is something that we report into monthly. And uh, Again, that's all tracked, and I think it's also available on the FBI uh, website where uh, people can go in and, and narrow down right to an agency and, and see what those numbers are. So again, uh, like I said, uh, you know, we're very transparent when it comes to that. Uh, we have a, a captain that's assigned uh, monthly that, uh, if any, we've, we've had a lot of zero months, uh, which is good. Um, and again, uh, that goes right from the use of force up to deadly force. And then the certification process with the Department of Justice. Yes, and again, this is something that uh, the Department of Justice uh, came out with. Uh, there's about 12 areas that we had to uh, show the Department of Justice that we had policies and procedures in place. And some of those were, uh, you know, termination of use of force, uh, the duty to intervene, our training protocols uh, for de-escalation, uh, medical care uh, during an uh, incident. Um, you know, no warning shots. We never shoot uh, warning shots. Uh, have a policy in place for uh, shooting at moving vehicles, which we do not do. Um, you know, hiring of personnel and community engagement. So again, uh, to, not to toot our horn all the time, Gary, but we had everything already in place that the Department of Justice required from uh, the Ottawa County Sheriff's Office and what they're requiring from other agencies nationwide. So with our policy and procedures, we had all these in place. We supplied all that to the DOJ along with other information and uh, they did certify us and, and we are in compliance with that. Uh, so again, it's, it's something I think it, it reflects upon our agency that 
we make sure that we are doing things right, uh, that we are sticking to the uh, state and federal standards and requirements. Uh, this also helps us comply with federal grant funding uh, in the future for programs. As I mentioned, uh, Steve is one of our uh, listening friends, and so he knows about uh, what Peg and I are trying to go through in terms of getting our vaccines. She's going through the county, I'm going through the private means, and I have a funny feeling that uh, she's going to get hers maybe long before I get mine. But anyway, uh, dealing with vaccines in the county jail, you're starting to vaccinate inmates now too. Yes, we are, Gary. And uh, again, the, uh, working with our uh, health department, uh, one of the requirements were to uh, vaccinate our citizens that are lodged in the Ottawa County Jail. And uh, we're going to be starting that process hopefully next week. Uh, you know, one of the challenges there is uh, which vaccine do they get? Uh, because you have the one where you have to have two shots, but you have J&J &J where you get the one. So we are looking at the J&J &J, uh, our concern is, is that if they get the first vaccine and they need the second and they're released from jail, will they go out and seek that second vaccine? So again, a lot of the uh, jail facilities are looking at the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, we have done extremely well during COVID of keeping COVID out of our jail facility. Um, when somebody comes into our facility from the outside, they're automatically quarantined uh, for seven days, uh, monitored uh, by our 24-7 uh, medical in the jail and then uh, they're allowed to go into their general housing area. But again, the, uh, for the people that have been sentenced to longer term, uh, you know, for the, the uh, listeners out there, uh, people are in the county jail for up to one year. Uh, we felt that the J&J &J would be the best vaccine uh, to give to them. In, in case they do get out, you know, in, in three or four weeks, we wanna make sure that they're vaccinated because uh, again, some will not seek that, uh, that second shot. Let's get a call in. Good morning. You're on the line with Sheriff Steve Kempker. Well, good morning, Gary. Thank you for taking the call again. I'm curious on uh, uh, who the Ottawa County Sheriff's Department serves. Does it serve the citizens and taxpayers of Ottawa County, or does it serve the Department of Justice? Good question there. Um, Who's, who, you know, it, it, it does, it does, you know, does lead to, to some, some head scratching in that regard. Oh, it does. You know, we, we work with the Department of Justice mostly on grants. Um, you know, we are, as a sheriff's office, uh, sworn in to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of Michigan. So, you know, uh, I always tell people that we report. Uh, you know, I have a county board to report to in that, but we're also uh, responsible to all of our citizens in Ottawa County. Um, so again, uh, everything that comes down, uh, you know, if it's federal law, uh, we do have to, you know, for law enforcement standards and all of that in our policy and procedures and best practices, uh, you know, I have a, a full legal team uh, that's available to me. Uh, you know, if I don't agree with something that comes out of the Department of Justice or have a question on that of how it's going to affect our operations, um, then I consult uh, with our, our, our legal staff here. And, and we do have a, a very excellent attorney on board. So, uh, I, like I said, we don't deal with the Department of Justice that much, Gary. Uh, like I said, most of it is under federal grant funding for uh, special positions or uh, specialized uh, equipment. Sometimes we get evidence type equipment uh, or equipment in our cars to the Department of Justice. You know, the automatic uh, defibrillators, the AEDs, uh, camera equipment. Uh, you know, our department just recently uh, received a federal grant uh, for a drone uh, for our operations here. And uh, that drone can be used uh, for numerous things uh, from traffic accident mapping to uh, helping locate a lost person. So there are benefits, but sometimes, yes, I do have questions as to what's coming from the federal level. And that's where I seek the advice of, uh, you know, our staff here at the county. Well, nothing comes from the government. It all comes from the taxpayers of Ottawa County. And then it goes to the government and then they give us back whatever they, they deem is necessary. Yeah, and I'll, I'll agree with you there because uh, what they do give back to us, I'm going to tell you that Ottawa County has been, at least the sheriff's office, has benefited greatly from grant dollars uh, from the Department of Justice. Uh, and I totally agree with you that it is our tax dollars that, that go in. And uh, I've seen great benefits, everything from uh, additional personnel that have gone onto our streets to help keep our uh, community safe and secure and our citizens, uh, because I'll hold our agency up to any other 
uh, agency around that. Uh, we provide good quality professional law enforcement services to our community uh, because again, I'm the sheriff of this county uh, and the deputies, and we are here to serve uh, this community and keep this community safe. And uh, you know, we do it by all means. Uh, we do a great job of it, I think, and we've got great staff. Appreciate the call. Thank you very much, because we are butting up towards the end of the hour. And just my final parting shot in the uh, challenge that Peg and I are having about who's going to get the vaccine first. No, I am not going to get myself incarcerated, so I can't be forced to that. <laughs> I, I, I think I'll go a different way, but I'll, you know, I'll eventually I'll get my shots and uh, uh, we'll be getting our vaccine. Steve yeah, Kempker, I, yeah, Steve Kempker, I want to thank you very much for joining us today well, on WHTC's uh, Talk of the Town program. I know that uh, we'll be chatting again, hopefully back at our usual time in April and uh, We'll talk a little bit about uh, maybe uh, making sure everybody is safe come tulip time, which begins in 30 days from today. Yep, I think spring's here finally. So again, thank you, Gary. Appreciate uh, having us on each month. And uh, again, thank you to, I just really want to say thank you to the Citizens of Ottawa County for the support of the Sheriff's Office and uh, the law enforcement officials in our uh, community here. Thank you very much, Steve Kempker on 99.7 and 1450 WHTC.